Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've joined us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is an interesting series entitled Making Friends for God, the Joy of Sharing in His Mission. Not our mission, His mission. And this is lesson number 10 in that series for September 5 of 2020, entitled An Exciting Way to Get Involved. Hmm. What do you suppose that would be about? As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to have easily available to us uh, the scriptures and a number of different translations, Many adv much advice, especially we think of the, the additional helps from Ellen White that, are, that help to make things so clear. May we now get inspired by thinking about ways we can get involved is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is strength in numbers. We know that. King Solomon, often called the wisest man who ever lived, recognized this principle. Jim? Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two are better off than one, because together they can work more effectively. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just too bad, because there is no one to help him. If it could, excuse me, if, if it is cold, two can sleep together and stay warm. But how can we, you keep warm by yourself. Two people can resist an attack that would defeat one person alone. A rope made of three cords is hard to break. American Bible Society, uh, 1992 edition. Yeah. Can so Solomon, with his 100, 700 wives and 200 concubines, shouldn't have had a trouble thinking about how to sleep alone. <laughs> Well, small groups have worked together effectively throughout Scripture. Even the Godhead works together as a very effective and efficient small group. Carrie? I'm going to read Genesis 1, 1-2, and verse 26, and it's from the Good News Bible. In the beginning, when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. Then God said, And now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. Okay. So you see, if you have the, if you're looking online or you have the handout which we make available, those plural pronouns. So God, you, well, he uses the plural word Elohim, which means more than one, followed in verse 26 by those plural pronouns. So God is saying even he has, the God has divided up responsibilities. It's not that, that uh, you know, one is way up there and the others are below or something like this, some other strange. No, they just divided up responsibility. Each, each one has his own responsibilities. I think he, uh, Yahweh, uh, is mentioned the most in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and then Elohim. Mm -hmm. But Elohim is plural. So is, it is in the uh, in the Islamic Book of Faith, Quran. Mm -hmm. It says we, we, again and again. Really? Yes, yes. Interesting. Despite their belief in Allah. Huh? There you are. Right. You know, again, and, and then they mention the Holy Spirit again mm -hmm. and again. Wow. So God was the first one to organize a small group. We're talking about small groups here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, we cannot begin to understand all the implications of that. Of that. We know that those three work together very closely while having individual responsibilities, making the work more efficient. In the birth of Christ, there we see the Father sending the Holy Spirit to impregnate Mary to give birth to the Son, baby Jesus. Later, at the time of his baptism, the voice of the Father was heard from, the, from, the, from up the sky. The dove representing the Holy Spirit was seen, and Jesus came up out of the water. All through his life, the three of them worked together to perform all that Jesus did. Even in his death, they cooperated. So how do we know that? Well, Jesus himself said in John 10, 17 and 18, 
Charles, I think that's yours. Yes. John 10, 17, 18. Um, the Father loves me because I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up on my own free will. I have the right to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. And you better. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 If the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from death lives in you, then he, will, he who raised Christ from death will also give life to you, your mortal bodies, by the presence of his Holy Spirit. Okay, and one um, more. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 More than that, we are shown to be lying about God because because we said that he raised raised Christ from death but if it is true that the dead are not raised from life then he did not raise Christ okay you remember that's a uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 he's he's trying to answer a group of people who who are saying you know it, resurrection isn't possible so he says well remember that if resurrection is not possible, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and therefore our faith is hopeless. Well, yeah, well, what about that? And I would ask to all those people who, who feel like uh, they're not sure that God was able to create the world in seven days, how's he going to recreate all the saints in order, at the second coming to take them to heaven? Boom, like that. Hmm. It has always been God's plan to work through every means he has available to him to save as many as possible. God could have created us as robots without the ability to rebel against him, but God's government never works by force or coercion, and there's a fabulous statement about that on page 22 of Desire of Ages. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth? Uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he's patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. Well. That's really a, our great hope. Yeah. Is we have someone that, that wants everything for us. Everything exactly. that we could possibly want he wants us to have. Yep. Well, we will spend the rest of eternity, I can assure you, studying the plan of salvation. So if you do not feel like you understand it fully right now, you're probably all right. <laughs> There's a little ways to go. Moses was born, and let's take some examples. Moses was born and preserved miraculously from the river. You remember that story lived those first years of his life sheltered in a wonderful Hebrew household, and then was educated in the royal palace of Pharaoh, but he was not yet ready to do God's will. He needed 40 years of herding sheep in the wilderness to prepare him. Then God called him to do the most important job, beginning at the age of 80. I wonder if there was laws about retirement age in those days. Hmm. There must be something about herding sheep, because over and over we're told that the herding of sheep is the thing that gave everyone their insight yeah. and yes. their, their faith. Patience. <laughs> if you've, Patience. If you've handled sheep, and my grandfather had some, I won't go into you know, all the ins and outs of it, but they, there's a saying, silly is a sheep, and they are silly. Mm -hmm. I've seen them get their neck through to get grass and then choke themselves trying to get their head back. All they had to do was reverse. They just, uh, they're a different animal to goats. Goats can size you up. Uh, and this sheep is just gross wool. That's about the best part of them. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> even at that point, having followed God's plan for delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, he was not above receiving advice from his father-in-law, Jethro. 
who wasn't even a Jew. Look at Exodus 18, 21 to 25. But in addition, you should choose some capable men. This is Jethro's advice to, to, to Moses. He was, a, he was a Midianite, I think. Yeah. Which means what? Where did um, he come from? <laughs> um, sorry, I knew. But, uh, <laughs> he was a descendant of Midian, who was, was one of the six sons of Abraham that were born to his third wife, Keturah. Right, right, right. Remember? The ones he, he sent away before he gave his inheritance yes. to Isaac? Yeah. Yes. Well, so he, and he, you should choose some capable men and appoint them as leaders of the people. Leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They must be God-fearing men who can be trusted and who cannot be bribed. Let them serve as judges for the people on a permanent basis. They can bring all the difficult cases to you, but they themselves can decide all the smaller case disputes. That will make it easier for you as they share your burden. If you do this as God commands, you will not wear yourself out, and all these people can go home with their disputes settled. Moses took Jethro's advice and chose capable men from among the Israelites. He appointed them as leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens from the Good News Bible. Do you remember what resulted from that whole thing? Well, it relieved Moses mm -hmm. and a lot of his stress. But uh, when that Moses... Not, that was not God's instruction. This is, it, Moses took uh, yeah, uh, yeah. advice from his father-in-law, who was not a, really a believer. He just was his father-in-law. And uh, so and maybe... But it worked. God didn't. It worked. Yeah, it worked. worked. Uh, it, it, was, it was good advice. Yeah, I think the Romans even took it from this guy. Right? I mean, there were centurions. There were... Yeah. But anyways. Yeah, I'm thinking about what happened later when um, he, he, he started getting advice not only from the father-in-law, but also from his wife. And Aaron and Miriam said, mm. you know, these people are replacing us here. This is not good. And mm -hmm. God... Remember in Numbers 12, boy, God let him have it, mm. straight between the eyes. Thus we see that even the children of Israel camping in the wilderness were organized into small groups, the smallest of which had 10 people. In, isn't it amazing that small group specialists tell us that the ideal size for group interaction is between 6 and 12? Mm -hmm. Jim? Luke 6, 12, to 13, 12 and 13. At that time, Jesus went up the hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he named apostles. Then Matthew 10, 1 and verse 8. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases, and drive out demons. Wow. Do we have any evidence that the disciples healed any leprosy or raised anyone from the dead while Jesus was still on this earth? I don't think any. Uh, they were sent out as missionaries. We know that. Okay. And these are his, these are his instructions. Go out there. Yes, and drive out the demons. Yes. Raise the dead. However... Transfiguration came how long before the crucifixion? Probably not too far. What happened not too transfiguration? long? Transfiguration. Oh, the transfiguration, no, shortly. Short. About, about six months. Six months, perhaps, right. The reason why, when they came down, they found there was a commotion. Mm -hmm. And these guys could not get the demon-possessed kid healed. Yep. Yep. But we must recognize that the groups that worked with Jesus were more than just his 12 disciples. What other groups? We talked about that last week. Carrie? I'm reading from the Good News Bible, Luke chapter 8, 1 to 3. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, 
Joanna, whose husband Chooser was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So um, here's a question for you out there. Does your pastor travel around with society women and former demon-possessed prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, did these did those women work to get work together as as a small group, taking care of the disciples and Jesus? It looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah. What did the disciples learn from Jesus about organizing and directing a small group? What kinds of things did Jesus accomplish through that small group? As we have seen in previous lessons, he turned the world upside down with that small group. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 25. Charles? Christ is like a single body, which has many, many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. A study of anatomy and physiology reveals that the organs of the body are organized into different interrelated systems. For example, the digestive, cardiovascular, respiratory, and skeletal are just a few of the body's complex organ systems. Spiritual gifts are like the different parts of the body. They function best when organized into systems of groups or groups. In fact, in most cases, they cannot function alone. Our bodies are not just a lump of separate organs freelancing away at whatever they do. Each bodily function is organized into a tightly knit system that works together toward a common good. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Yeah. I don't know if we ever stop and think about this, but every once in a while I stop and think about this and it just blows my mind. Inside of the, the human body, has, the adult human body has more than a trillion cells. And those little strands of DNA, microscopic things, we are, it's only been a few score of, of, of years, that we, a few scores of years that we've been able to even see them under electron microscopes. And yet, that, that little chemical thing says, to this cell, you go there, and you do this, and you go there, and you do this, mm -hmm. and you go there, and do this, you go there, and do this, and so forth, and then you do your job, and we'll all co cooperate together, and, we'll do, and you, over here, you get this responsibility, then you lose the, response, the ability to do what these guys over here are doing. And these guys over here lose the ability to do what those guys are doing. How in the world do you program all of that yeah. into those, the, those little strands of chemicals? And the evolutionists think that just came from a of snap. Of course. Just a snap. A primordial ooze. <laughs> a primordial ooze. <laughs> a congealing ooze. of gases. Mm -hmm. They think a, a mono lake up there, they think, oh, the, the, you you know, that salt water, the, 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 there's, there's bubbles out of the essence is there. Retirement. And the enzymes and the coenzymes yeah. involved yeah. in yeah. these uh, Every time I see biochemical I actions. marvel at a hummingbird. Yeah. I mean, you see these big airliners going over, and they're, they're, they're not bad feats of engineering, but the little hummer outdoes them all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that evolution way of looking at life has been prevalent for over 150 yeah. years. And now we've got to get to the point of chaos, as it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. And uh, the, the time of trouble in Daniel 12.1 is referenced. So that's, uh, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Well, when working alone, it is very easy to become discouraged or to be distracted by some other responsibility. However, when we are working together, it is easier to keep our focus on the common goal. The formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. If there is a large number in the church, let the number... Num Whoops, let the members be formed into small companies to work not only for the church members, but for unbelievers. If in one place there are only two or three who know the truth, let them form together into a band of workers. 
Let them keep their bond of union unbroken, pressing together in love and unity, encouraging one another to advance, each gaining courage and strength from the assistance of the others. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 21 and 22. Wow. So, there should be no question about the fact that God intended for us to continue our work of finishing the gospel by organizing into small groups. Now, we've said that this is whose work? What, is it, what does our lesson title say? It's God's work. It's his work. Yeah. We just cooperate with him. Yeah. So this is his work. We need to remember that. This is God's work. So what can we learn about small groups from the experience of the disciples and the apostles in early Christianity? Very quickly, the work expanded beyond the time and capacity <laughs> of the 11 disciples. I mean, how many evangelists have gone out to hold a series of meetings and the first day you baptize 3,000? Yeah. <laughs> wow. There's a story told that uh, bowls me away every time I think about it. One of the our early Adventist pioneers who worked especially with young people was taken down, invited to go down to Kingston, Jamaica to uh, hold a series of meetings. And he was in a big auditorium right out close to the edge of the water and the, the, there, because it's of course a, uh, Jamaica's an island. And there was a whole bunch of young pastors there sitting on the front row learning how you conduct these evangelistic series. And he got up and he presented, he was supposed to present the first night of materials. And he, boy, about five minutes he was finished talking about that and he, he went on to the next night, what he was supposed to talk about the next night, and then he went on the third night and the fourth night, he just kept right on going. It just seemed like every, he would just go say a few words and so forth about something and he'd go on to the next, and these guys in the front row were dying, front row were about to die of shock, what this guy was doing. He finished the whole series and made a call and hundreds of people came forward to be baptized. Uh -huh. And that night there was the Kingston earthquake and the whole building in every place where the whole thing where they were sitting was completely buried in the ocean. There was never another meeting. Yeah. So how did he know? <laughs> Who guided that evangelistic series, a complete evangelistic series in one night? Okay, Acts 18. Well, let's just look at this first. Um, to looking at, look at Paul for an example. Well, you know, the, the disciples, they chose a replacement for Judas. We know that very, almost immediately. But soon they felt it necessary to choose seven men who were called deacons in Acts chapter 6. Paul was constantly working with other groups. Think about the stories you, could, you know about Paul. Look at Acts 18, 1 to 5, for example. After this, Paul left Athens and went on to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. You remember, uh, for the emperor, I guess it says right here, for the emperor Claudius had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and stayed and worked with them because he earned his living by making tents just as they did. He held discussions in the synagogue every Sabbath trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. So now he's working with one group. Well, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul gave his whole time to preaching the message testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And then we, 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 we pass through a few years, and now we, fall, we pick up Paul later. He was getting ready to go to Syria when he discovered that there were Jews plotting against him. So he decided to go back to Macedonia. So, I mean, it's easy for us to read that. Do you realize what that says? He was planning to get on a boat, take an easy ride for two, three days, and he would be in Ephesus. Okay? Instead, because these people were on there, these Jews got on that boat with a specific intention of when Paul got, when they got, when the boat got launched, they would have Paul in their hands and they planned to kill him. So he ends up walking like 600 miles around. So, he's getting ready to go to Syria. There were, uh, there were Jews plotting against him, so he decided to go back to Macedonia. Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Berea, 
went with him, and so did Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia, and Timothy. Now, why were all those people traveling with him? Well, probably if they didn't want him to die alone. Yeah, that would be part of it. There can be multiple reasons for working in small groups. Paul had gone to great lengths, in this case, to raise a lot of money from Gentile converts in Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia is a place where Corinth is located. He was preparing to take all that money back to Jerusalem for the benefit of the poor there. So he needed a number of people to travel with him just to carry the gold and to protect each other. Can you imagine Paul all by himself traveling that huge long distance carrying I mean, more gold than you could carry. Hmm. So, Jim? On this occasion, Paul and his companions formally presented to the leaders of the work at Jerusalem the contributions forwarded by the Gentile churches for the support of the poor among the Jewish brethren. The gathering of, those, of these contributions had cost the apostle and his fellow workers much time, anxious thought, and wearisome labor. The sum, which was far, which far exceeded the expectations of the elders at Jerusalem, represented many sacrifices and even severe privations on the part of the Gentile believers. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, Apostles, page three ninety nine. And despite all that, and despite all that, when that was all over, they told Paul, "Well, you need to prove that you're a real Jew." Shave your head, go to the temple, go with these guys, go through this ritual that's an ancient Jewish ritual, and then we'll know that you're, you really, you're really a Jew. Here they're talking to a, one of the leading, former leading Pharisee. Yeah. And Paul says, well, okay, if you think it's a good idea. And of course he ended up getting arrested and spent most of the rest of his life in prison. It is clear that Paul chose people from a variety of churches, talking about this particular journey, so they could all eventually report back to their home base about how the money was handled and delivered to the people in Jerusalem. He didn't want to take any chances, and he was say, well, Paul's just collecting all his money. He's going to disappear somewhere. He's just going to have a good time. Is this the time when some of the brethren wept, wept on his shoulders, saying, we will not see you again? This, this was, was part time. of that journey. This yeah. was part because when you mentioned that and he got, was thrown in the jail, this was of course in Rome that he was taken there, and there's a there. He, he was died. first thrown in jail in Jerusalem, and then right, he was taken right. to Caesarea Maritime, and then he had that then, fateful ship, ship. water so journey. Malta, I and think. Ended up right. spent the winter in Malta and finally mm -hmm. got to Rome. Yeah. And going there back to. Jerusalem to deliver the funds and he gets humiliated of all things. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. No doubt each of those chosen associates also had special skills and abilities that were of mutual benefit. I mean, imagine this group of men and maybe some women traveling together, visiting churches as they go along, mm -hmm. benefiting them, working with them. Meanwhile, doing what? Carrying a lot of money. When traveling to a new area, it was Paul's custom to search out the local synagogue or synagogues and preach to the members. Often he would be successful in converting some to Christianity. But later he was often rejected and thrown out by the remaining members of the synagogue. <laughs> but there were times when he traveled to cities such as Philippi when apparently no synagogue had been established. So what did he do? Gary? I'm going to read from Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 15 and 40. We left by ship from Troas and sailed straight across to Samothrace and the next day to Neapolis. From there we went inland to Philippi, a city of the first district of Macedonia. It is also a Roman colony. We spent several days there. On and the I, can I interrupt for a second? We're going to read about, well, we, presumably you, if you're familiar with the Bible, you out there know some about what happened there at Philippi. What does it mean to say Philippi was a Roman colony? 
You know what that means? Be one of their Philip, outposts, wouldn't it? What? Be one of the Roman army's outposts. That's correct. That's exactly right. So Rome, it was Rome's goal to spread Rome basically over the whole world. They wanted, they wanted eventually to be control of everything. And so as they were, as they were developing, uh, you served a certain period of time in the Roman army, and then you were discharged. And they would take a group of these recently discharged soldiers, and they would put them in charge of one of these cities. They would say, "Okay, this is your city. You're gonna you're gonna be treated. You're gonna treat the people in this city, and you yourselves are gonna treat as if you are just a part of Rome. You are Roman citizens." And that's how Paul became a Roman citizen. It's that kind of thing. It, that his city was one of those Roman cities. Tarshish. Okay. Hmm? Tarshish. Tar yes. yes, Tarsus. Yeah. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. One of those who heard us was Lydia from Thyatira, who was a dealer in purple cloth. <clears throat> she was a woman who worshipped God, and the Lord opened her mind to pay attention to what Paul was saying. After she and the people of her house had been baptized, she invited us, Come and stay in my house if you have decided I am a true believer in the Lord. And she persuaded us to go. Paul and Silas left the prison and went to Lydia's house. They met the believers, spoke words of encouragement to them, and left. That's from the Good News Bible. Yeah, we just skipped over that whole experience in the prison, the Philippian prison, but because that's not what we're talking about right now. But so what do they do as soon as they got out of prison, as soon as they finished baptizing the jailer and his family and, and preaching the gospel to them, where do they go? To Lydia's house, where they had been welcomed. Peter also worked with small groups that used their prayers to support him in his ministry. There were 5,000 male Christian believers in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. When Peter was imprisoned and expecting to be executed the next morning, an amazing event took place. Peter was miraculously released from prison. Then what did he do? You remember this story. He was arrested, thrown in prison, and Herod was determined to make an example of this guy. So he had, was it 16? Was it? Yeah, I think 16. Uh, soldiers the, guarding him. That lost their lives. Okay. Yeah. Guarding him with several gates. So there's no possible way for him to... He was chained to two soldiers, for example. Mm. And what happened? Acts 12, 11 to 19. Then Peter realized what had happened to him and said, Now I know that it is really true. The Lord sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's power and from everything that Jewish people expected to happen. Aware of his situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the do outside door, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer it. She recognized Peter's voice and was so happy that she ran back in without opening the door and announced that Peter was standing <laughs> outside. <laughs> You're mad, <laughs> they told her. But she insisted that it was true. So they answered, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter was kept on knocking. <laughs> At last, they opened the door, and when they saw him, they were amazed. He motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And he explained to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell this to James and the rest of the believers, he said. Then he left and went somewhere else. Let when, me interrupt there before you read the last. Uh, well, go ahead and read the next par paragraph. When morning came, there was a tremendous confusion among the guards. What had happened to Peter? Herod gave orders to search for him, but they could not find him. So he had so he, so he so he had the guards questioned and ordered them to be put to death yeah yeah hmm. i can you imagine 
you are you are there at the, ins guards. the, the inside of this prison. You're, you're three or four doors in there, all locked and so forth. You can't get out yourself. And there you are. You're chained to these to, to Peter. You your handcuff. His his hand uh, was in a handcuff on you, and the other half of the handcuff. And you're sleeping. And you wake up in the morning as mm. there's no Peter. <laughs> I mean, you know. I think I might have died of shock right there. I wouldn't have to wait for Herod to kill me. I bet they looked high and low. Oh, yeah. Probably look right but if this is not too far from cross, from the cross. That's right. <clears throat> Herod had seen the greatest political coup ever pulled when Jesus came out of the grave. And he knew this. Mm -hmm. And this is what he does. He kills. I mean, he has gone mad, obviously. Yeah. Well, this story about Peter knocking on the door and the group's response, it is his angel, is one of our key verses suggesting that we all have guardian angels. We do not know exactly what small group it was who were praying for Peter, and no doubt there are many other groups in Jerusalem also praying for him. But in the larger context of the great controversy, it gave God permission, we talked about this earlier, it gave God permission to act and release Peter from prison and save his life. So if a lot of people are praying for something, God, Satan can't say, God, you can't do this. You don't have a right. And God says, those people are asking me to do it. Yeah. Well, an interesting aspect of this whole story is what comes next. The Roman Catholic Church has always claimed that the Pope is a direct spiritual descendant from Peter himself, whom they claim was the head of the first Christian church. When Peter was released from prison, thus saving his life, he went immediately to that small group meeting in the home of John Mark's parents. After speaking with them briefly, Paul, Peter said, tell this to James and the rest of the believers, Acts 17, 12, 17. What does this tell us about who was re regarded at the, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem at that time? James was the leader. James. And later we're going to find out in chapter 15 of Acts, when there was a big discussion about whether or not Gentiles should be admitted to the Christian church, who was in charge? James. James. He was the first one to be beheaded also. No, that's the other James. This is the one that was beheaded was the brother of John. This is the, this is the, brother of, the stepbrother of Jesus. Jesus himself, yeah. right, right, yes. It is known that there were at least 200 synagogues in and around Jerusalem. The size of each one of those synagogues was small to medium. Do you think, now of course remember, that what, was, what happened at the synagogue was completely different than what happened at the temple. You had to go to the temple to sacrifice a lamb, to have your sins forgiven, to pay your tithe, that kind of stuff. But the synagogues is where they would meet on Sabbath and be taught and all that kind of stuff. Very quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, this James, the half-brother of Jesus, he was a skeptic with mm -hmm. his other half-brothers as well. Where do we read this? In Mark, I think, chapter 4 or somewhere there. Yeah. Well, uh, they all declared that Jesus had gone nuts. Yeah. And this is the same brother. Yes. And it's interesting that this all happened. They all, his mother and his brothers are brought yeah. into the story in Acts 1. All of a sudden, here they are apart, working oh. with the disciples. Well... Do you think some of the Christians continued to worship with the Jews in the synagogues? What do you think? Possible? I was going to say, it might, be, it might have been a few. If they were rejected in the synagogues then, it would have been natural for them to meet in small groups and homes. In our day, small groups are very important because it is much easier for a person who is being attracted to the gospel to meet in someone's home that he knows than it is to be taken to a formal church gathering where there might be many people she or he has never met before. Right. You know, there are countries, small groups are pretty dynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Sometimes we seem to apply that the entire Christian group met in the upper room. That would have been completely impossible. So what do we know about that upper room? Acts 4.31 When they finished praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken. 
They were all filled with Holy Spirit and began to proclaim God's message with boldness. And if we read the context there, that happened in the upper room. So go ahead. Acts 12.12, 12. aware of this situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So the implications there is that this was also in the upper room. and this. So that's how we know that we, it's pretty certain that the home of John Mark's parents was the place where the upper room was located. And what what other bits of it, what other bit of proof do we have for that? Do you remember? Remember what it says in Mark uh, fifteen. Uh, might, no, it might be fourteen. I'm sorry. 14, let's try 1450, something like that. Um, then all the disciples left him and ran away. This is when, the, when the, they came to arrest him at the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. A certain young man, dressed only in a linen cloth, was following Jesus. This is John. Mark. They tried to arrest him, but he ran away naked, leaving the cloth behind. And who, John Mark. and who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Same guy. Mark. So why is he the only one that mentions this? <laughs> he, he remembers, he remembers it very it well. Clearly. He says, I want you to know that I was there. And this is the first Gospel he said. was, that mm -hmm. was First Gospel to be read. That's right. I, I have a very quick uh, question. Yeah. I, I, you know this. The small groups are popping up all over, even this country. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they probably are as faithful, if not, they take this to their heart very seriously, the message. Which I think is time has come. There seems to almost be a, a movement for people to not belong to a recognized church. And because of that, those with similar thinking or those that are just studying together mm -hmm. are coming together very frequently. Well, and, and you know, that's because there's so much, so much downplaying of, of religious ceremonialism and all that kind of stuff. And so people are saying, well, you know, let, let's get together and we'll, we'll talk about the Bible. We'll talk about, and not, ever, not all of them are doing the best. There's a lot of other... I mean, you, you just put a group of people together and let's talk about what we think is important and you can go into all kinds of craziness, but it's, the idea is, is great. But people are wanting to study. Yeah. They are wanting to, to investigate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So small groups can help us not only by supporting us with their prayers and encouraging us to stay faithful to our goals and reaching out to others, but they also provide a wonderful fellowship of encouragement. Some of us belong to a Sabbath school class where we meet and have a potluck every month or two. And it's Sounds great good. fellowship, wonderful fellowship. Try to imagine yourself in one of the groups of people that follow Jesus. Except for his time of prayer at night and early in the morning, he must have been flocked by people continuously. Mm -hmm. Is it any surprise that he made the following comments? Matthew 9, 37 and 38. So he said to his disciples, The harvest is still large, but there are few workers to, get it, to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. Lord, please help me. How am I supposed to handle this huge crowd of people, right? <clears throat> How much help were the disciples in dealing with those crowds? Can you think of an example? Well, they let him know certain people were there, the children, yeah. what do we do with the kids, yeah. and a few other incidents along similar lines. And you think of one kid that did something very special? The five loaves of bread. In the oh, yeah. yeah. That's the kid that came with his lunch. Andrew's one. Oh, there's a kid here that's still, you know, how are we going to get a year's wage for a common laborer who wouldn't buy enough bread to fill this crowd? Yeah. And Jesus says, well, Andrew says, there's a kid over here that's got a lunch. I don't know what... Uh, the kid probably even offered it. You can never yeah. tell. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Five loaves and two fishes. That was a, f a fair sized meal. Well, this is these are these are little biscuits. Yeah. They're not, and the fish were probably Anyone. small in size. But I mean, I, I think about this kid. You know, mom gives gives him his lunch. He says, "Okay, the, I want to go see Jesus." You know, that by far the most exciting thing that's going on in this whole territory. I want to be there. His mom says, "Okay, stuff this stuff in your bag and go over there." And so he's over there, and you can see him all day long. He's sitting there, and every you know, every so often, he's a young kid. He must have been thinking, "Is it time to eat now? Yeah. <laughs> Is it time to eat now? <laughs> Is it time to eat now?" And then all of a sudden, someone comes and he offers his meal. I'm sure he thought that he was offering his meal for Jesus, because Jesus has been doing all this, and all of a sudden, I got baskets of it. Okay, now I want. <laughs> I want you to tell me what did the kid say to his mom when he got home? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with all the leftovers. Yeah, with. Might have taken some home to him. I'm sure he did. <laughs> and know? he said, Mom, do you remember those <laughs> dry biscuits you sent me with? I Try some of this. Isn't that going to be great in heaven when the Lord says, Come over, kid. This was the kid you yeah. all studied about toward the world. Yep. Yeah. Command. So that's one example when the disciples helped to organize things. He told everybody to sit down in groups. Yeah. Ellen White says groups of about 50. Uh, and so did Jesus have to multiply all those things and then give them to disciples, or did some of them multiply as they were handing them out? Have you ever thought about that? I think the basket never ended. Mm -hmm. They put their hand in there. Yeah. There's still more than still yeah. more coming. So. I can like, see the first time that that happened, that the disciples would have been yeah. kind of confused about it. <laughs> and, but then the second time around, they should have kind of gotten the, the memory that, gee, the last time we did this, it worked out okay. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yep. Oh. Um. It should be clear that the focus of each of the groups we have spoken about was witnessing and service. Could it be that today? God, could it be that today God is calling us to organize into small groups to continue that ministry? Those who have been able to organize or join an effective small group find it absolutely exciting and spiritually rewarding. It is important for the small groups to get organized, to keep their focus on reaching out, Otherwise, it is easy for the group to, de to deteriorate into nothing more than a discussion group, which isn't bad, but not what we really want to accomplish. There are two verses in the book of Acts which add an extra dimension to the question of working with groups. Jim? And Acts 6, verse 7, And so the word of God came, continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Acts fifteen five, but some of the believe, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and let, and told to obey the law of Moses. Okay, so you have a small group, and all of a sudden, a former priest shows up. Yeah, <clears throat> and what do you do? He says, I'd like to be a part of this group. Or a former Pharisee. Priests and Pharisees, Sadducees and Pharisees are joining the Christian group. Well, you remember back in Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Mm -hmm. if, he, if they'd heard that, these Pharisees had heard that message, maybe they would be a little bit more <laughs> humble. <laughs> Well, uh, these ones who joined the Christian group must have recognized that, you know, they needed some help. So how do you suppose former members of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even priests, were integrated into the small groups? Did they want to, did they try to take over? They became ordinary people. They ah. became just as ordinary as the fishermen, and I think that was the beauty of the of the I, church. I wish that were true, but I, that's not the impression I get because 
a few years later, they're having the first general conference. That was the problem. No, I'm sorry. And what happens? <laughs> there are already a bunch of Pharisees there demanding how this situation is going to be handled. And who invited them to be a part of the general conference? Well, they thought they got it together. Well, that's my point. If they thought they had it together, those are the kind of people you want to watch out for. <laughs> right, right. It has been seen that prayer, Bible study, fellowship and witnessing are the key elements of a successful small group. Small groups that focus only on witnessing often burn themselves out because of ceaseless activity. They need prayer, Bible study, and fellowship to keep them going. It is important to remember that our witness is not only to the world and other church members, but also to the universe. Gary? I'm reading from the book Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 9 to 10 and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages. In order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. And that's from Good News Bible. Wow. <clears throat> what could we as church members possibly teach the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world? Well, you got the crucifixion. Yeah. That uh, was the first Corinthians, excuse me, uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, yeah. 9 and 10, and John 12, 32, and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. It's... Uh, so what are, we, what are you saying there? What you're saying is what we're teaching the universe is how God deals with sinners. Right. His incredible love. Well, he had a problem uh, in John, or excuse me, Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, uh, well, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. This mm -hmm. earth is a spectacle of men and angels. It's for teaching. Yeah. Education of the heavenly intelligences. And we get to... Be we part get to of be it. guinea pigs. Why are we guinea pigs? Why do they call it angelic rulers? Good question. Well, you, you can go to Psalms eighty-two and uh, Deuteronomy thirty-two uh, eight and nine, uh, and of course you they they were all if, if you, Deuteronomy thirty-two eight and nine uh, it says when God separated the nations He did it according to the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? That would be the well, uh, and el angels. I'm just wondering if it's got several possible meanings. Angels, uh, I was on the impression most of them uh, were kept in heaven, but they must move around as messengers and all that oh, kind sure. of thing. Sure. Well, here's a, here's a verse that might be helpful if I can get to the right place. Job 38, verse 7. Let's see, let's see here, yeah, 38, come on down here, guys. In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted Good for joy. joy. Talking about creation yes. of this earth. Yeah. And then so you that, get to Revelation 12, 4, yeah, the sure. dragon's tail swept down a third of those stars. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. And there's no other group... No other persuasion, Jewish or, or Christian, that has had those insights. And, of course, yeah. Paul and Ellen White are the ones that, that made it available yeah. to us. Well, what did Jesus himself say about groups that would continue to carry on the gospel about his, after he was gone? This is from Jesus' prayer. Uh, that's in John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us just as you are in me and I in, am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. 
I in them and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them as you love me. God loves us as he loved Jesus, and he wants us to be in fellowship as close, the relationship between us and Christ should be as close as the relationship between Christ and his Father. You know, I mean, that just bowls me away. I, I've been an Adventist all my life, you know, and this Adventist schooling, and, and this is lacking. It, it, this is, it has to be, the day of Pentecost has to happen in yeah. our lives before the Lord will come yeah. to take us home. Well, Christ's plan for us to be in cooperation with us just as he is in cooperation with the Father. So looking over the whole picture, why do you suppose there was a, such an explosive growth in the early Christian church? First of all, we must recognize that, that much of it was a result of the work that Jesus had already done. But, and I They quote, continued no. steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Acts 2.42 Does that sound a little bit like a, a small group? <clears throat> Even when being threatened with murder, these early Christians continued to witness and meet in small groups and continued to fellowship together. Just as the different systems work in the whole human body to sustain, nourish, and support each other, so small groups in the Christian church should do that for the church. Involvement in a small group fosters Christian commitment, responsibility, and accountability. Christianity is not a solo act. We are Christians in community contributing by using our gifts in and for the community. Our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 134. Small groups were organized in the early church for specific tasks. However, they quickly began to expand their outreach to include much more. Think of the deep deacons that were chosen to wait tables and soon became great evangelists. One of the things that we must be extremely careful about in the organization of small groups is thinking that every group must be the same. In the New Testament, there were different groups meeting different needs, performing different ministries for the good of the whole. Could a Sabbath school class be organized into a small group? Absolutely. Our Bible study guide ends with three, these three practical possibilities. Have you ever thought of starting a small nurture group in your home? Is there a ministry group that the Holy Spirit has been pressing you to become a member of? And finally, what would you think of your Sabbath school class becoming a Sabbath school action unit that meets once a month to prayer, fellowship, study the Word, plan a Sabbath school class, mission activity? In the New Testament, Christ, Christian church, there were no spectators. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying these records, these marvelous and inspiring records. May we learn from them. May we practice their example is our prayer in Jesus' name.